Hello and welcome to LBMA webinars. Welcome to 2022. Uh, for our first webinar this year, we're going to show you the fourth session uh, from our Global Precious Metals Conference, which took place in September last year. Uh, the session was titled Key Challenges Facing the Global Mining Industry. Um, and part of the panel, uh, we have our moderator, Roger Baxter, who is the CEO of Minerals Council South Africa. Um, we have a keynote presentation from Mark Bristow, who is the CEO and president of Barrett Gold. Making up the rest of the panel, we have Paul Fisher, who is the LBMA board chairman. Uh, we also have Martin Horgan, who is the CEO of Sentinel. And finally, last but not least, we do have Natasha Villian, who is the CEO of Anglo-American Platinum. So without further ado, let's take a look. We're going to be dealing with the challenges facing the global mining industry. Uh, and uh, we've got a real expert panel who are going to give us some ideas on the issues that we're facing um, at the global mining industry side. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with Mark Bristow is going to give us a 15 minute keynote upfront setting the scene um, uh, uh, objective and presentation. We're then going to go into a quick input from Tasha, five minutes from her, Martin, five minutes and from Paul, five minutes. And that will be focused on their views on each of the different topics. We'll go into a bit of a QA, and a And then once we've got that Q&A process uh, up and running, we'll take your questions in the session. So it's a really... Um, Great topic. We've only got an hour, uh, and unfortunately, an hour flashes by very quickly. You know, when you're having fun. So I did ask our colleagues to fasten their seatbelts. So I'm going to ask you to fasten yours. And without further ado, I'm going to go straight to Mark, and Mark's going to give us his 15-minute keynote. And Mark, let me hand over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Roger. And uh, as you explained, we have been tasked with addressing the key challenges facing the gold mining industry. A subject so large I could spend all day talking about it instead of the 15 minutes I've been allocated. As we all know, mining is by its very nature a challenging business. Mines are large, complex, and risk-laden industrial enterprises run by people who have to manage them through commodity price cycles, find replacement for dwindling mineral reserves, convert them to renewable energy sources, and in many cases, find, build, and operate them in challenging jurisdictions with poorly developed infrastructure. So today I plan to focus on an overarching issue that affects us all, and that is the need to advocate for mining to the societies and general population who needs it serves uh, in countless and in growing ways. It's worth recalling that mining has been adv advancing human civilization since our remote ancestors started using copper in the Middle East some 11,000 years ago. And today copper remains a material of critical strategic importance, a key component not only of the global power distribution infrastructure, but of all the new clean energy technologies. And in fact, these technologies are reliant on a wide range of mined resources. Mining has been the primary driver of economic development throughout the world and still performs that vitally important function in emerging countries. Its products touch the lives of every person, every day, and in many ways. We depend on at least 90 metals and minerals to support and power the global economy. Yet, in spite of a contribution to mankind that few of any other industries can match, it has never been given its due, taken for granted at best, and at worst depicted as a ruthless exploiter of countries and people and a reckless despoiler of the environment by activists and various of various persuasions. Sadly, acts and emissions by rogue players and even some industry leaders have given some credence to this perception. It's therefore encouraging to note that a fight back has started with the World Gold Council's responsible gold mining principles and the closely aligned mining principles of the International Council on Mining and Metals. Representing the views of a broad range of stakeholders, 
These principles address key environmental, social, and governance issues and provide a credible framework within which mining companies can demonstrate that their gold um, or other metals and minerals has been produced responsibly. But again, as miners, we could do better by standing up for ourselves and ensuring we talk with one voice and promote our own well thought through regulations, rather than constantly trying to comply with a plethora of third party or activist derived regulations. ESG as an investment thesis has moved from the margins to the mainstream and this is definitely a good thing. However, it also presents some challenges with the number of disclosures, tools and metrics used to score a company's performance ever increasing. As an industry, we need to be working with investors and raters to improve the understanding of what good looks like. When it comes to ESG, because ultimately we know our industry best. We should be striving for equivalency and ultimately having one set of reporting guidelines for the industry. As only then can we start making meaningful comparisons and focusing our attention on those ESG metrics that actually add value. Getting to what good looks like is one of the reasons we worked with the World Gold Council and ICMM on the responsible gold mining principles and the mining principles respectively, along with driving equivalency between the two. It is also a key reason to Barrick developing our own ESG sustainability scorecard. The scorecard, which is a first for our industry, sets out the sustainability issues most relevant for our business as well as our industry. It not only benchmarks ourselves against our peers, but also importantly drives internal performance. Creating a heightened awareness of my, mining's industrial and commercial importance is only one challenge, however. The need to reorientate mining companies as modern businesses in step with society's rapidly changing demands and expectations is really the key challenge we face as an industry. The new model is exemplified by the current emphasis on ESG. But as I say often, I must caution against neglecting the equally important S and G for social and governance criteria in favor of just the E for environment. The basic principles of ESG have been around for a long time, but I think it's fair to say that until quite recently, chief executives of mining companies have been content to look upon these as feel good factors, which could be relegated to their CSR departments and or a tool to try and outcompete their peers in the compliance stakes. While this attitude is changing, there's still more we can do to reconsider in a fundamental way our priorities. If you'll forgive me, I'd like to draw on my experience at Barrick and previously at Rand Gold to show that ESG is not a passing market whim but should always have been a key element of the way we run our businesses. What we call our social license to operate has long been a strategic imperative for us. Essentially, we believe that a mining company should serve not only its shareholders, but also its host countries and communities as a good corporate citizen and a welcome neighbor who shares the values it creates fairly with all its stakeholders. And we define stakeholders as any constituency involved in our operations 
or affected by their presence. A growth in the return to investors should not be at the expense of other stakeholders, including employees, the environment and society at large. Alex Edmonds, a professor of finance at the London Business School, recently published a book titled Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. In it, he notes that many chief executives still see the value that the company creates as a fixed quantity, which he describes as a pie. They believe that anything you give to stakeholders cuts a slice out of that pie. <clears throat> In other words, is at the expense of profits. He argues persuasively that academic evidence and empirical research show that when companies invest in stakeholders and they take their obligation to benefit those stakeholders seriously, <clears throat> their long-term financial performance and profits improve. Instead of cutting up the pie, they're growing it. Far from being a necessary evil, Mining can and should be a force for good, good in the world. This is particularly true of those disadvantaged countries where a mining company committed to its stakeholders can transform the frontier regions with subsistence activities focused only on survival as their norm into sustainable economic hubs, providing modern conveniences and employment opportunities that liberate people both economically and politically. It's another sign of the times that people want products to have an ethical provenance and the industry is vulnerable to the investor and consumer's perception of responsibly resourced minerals and metals. In the gold industry, we have our share of illegal miners so it's essential that gold should have impeccable track and trace credentials to maintain the trust of investors and regulators. As the World Gold Council is advocating, we're on the cusp of a new industrial revolution driven by rapid advances in digital technology. This should be employed to ensure that the integrity of the gold and other metals and minerals supply chain is fully transparent. The World Gold Council even envisages the use of technology to create fungible and interoperable local and regional markets where gold could be used for in alternative purposes from collateralization to new sources of funding. It's also working to move the gold market from an opaque bilateral system to a more transparent model. So in conclusion, and I'm now speaking to my colleagues in the greater gold industry, from us miners to the refiners and consumers, it's up to us to make the case for gold and why it should form part of every balanced portfolio for institutional investors worldwide. As for the mining industry as a whole, the world couldn't exist without us. Instead of being defensive, we should assert our right to be recognized as the age old foundation of economic development, now successfully adapting themselves to the changing temper of the times. Thank you, Roger. So Mark, thanks very much for setting the scene. And uh, I must say that uh, your focus on this advocacy around mining playing that critical foundational role uh, for the world's economy and in particular in developing countries uh, is a critical one. Uh, I think that old adage, if it can't be mined, it has to be grown, uh, certainly comes to mind. But I think it's also it's uh, hashtag making mining matter, uh, the advocacy about uh, that this mining industry 
the responsible part of it really needs to play a significant role in driving that debate, getting people to recognize and trust the sector, which is very much what you were saying there. So I think uh, appreciate you sharing those, uh, those comments, uh, those inputs in your keynote. Uh, and from my side, let me hand over to Natasha. Natasha is going to give us uh, a perspective on um, more on the platinum side. But Natasha, let me hand across to you for your perspective, please. Thanks. Thank you so much, Roger, and thank you, Mark, um, for that very meaningful opening address. I think um, you've certainly covered um, the, a wide range of the challenges um, we're facing. Um, and as, as these are pretty well known, um, the, the kind of basic challenges like a declining resource base, a continuous fight for, for water um, and energy, those are the basic kind of challenges that we as a mining industry continue to, um, to have. I think it's an overlay to that though. We start to see um, over the last number of years an increase in societal expectation. We see that unless we focus on the S in the ESG as Mark has um, reflected on, um, that we will um, probably never develop our assets to its full potential and really um, if, and extract the maximum value that we have out of these assets for all of, um, for all of the stakeholders. I think there's probably a couple of very near-term challenges that we've seen through, through COVID and the um, unprecedented challenge that linked into, into society and to society's need for very basic resources like water and, and food and, the, and just the devastating impact of COVID on society through the loss of loved ones directly impacting efficiency and safety in, in the workplace. I think therefore vaccination and the vaccination drive become so very important and a big challenge for us as an industry is how do we do away and by get past the myths around um, vaccinations and getting our colleagues to really take that up and building a much safer, safer, safer environment for us to, um, to operate in. Now we've spoken about ESG as a pillar and, and again, to match on to what, what Mark said, um, ESG where in the past it would have been optional, it's becoming a prerequisite and truly a pillar to how we deliver value into, um, into society. If we look at the E of ESG and we consider the decarbonization drive globally, um, it is the challenge on how we decarbonize, specifically if you consider that we as a company are operating in a country that's predominantly fed by um, energy from um, carbon resources. And how we make that transition um, in a just way, considering that as a country, we're still very reliant on, on carbon. As a business, we rely on carbon. How do we make that transition whilst taking the countries that we operate um, in with us. I think there's an, they, we see an increasing um, reliance on many developing countries for the resources required for us to make that, um, that step in, in carbon neutrality. So it is interesting, um, Roger, you've touched on the fact if it's not grown, it's mined, and there's a big interdependency between those two um, items. But there's also a big interdependency between the value creation, not only for our shareholders, but, but for the broader society. And despite that interdependency, we see that as a mining sector, we have a very bad reputation amongst the general um, public. Um, and many of our customers and, and regulators. And over many years, we haven't necessarily um, covered ourselves um, with, with glory. But the reality is, if we look at what the mining sector is um, in changing that perception, and not, we're probably not very good in governance, but the reality of the work that we are doing on the ground is starting to make an impact that without that, we won't see the local economic development that is required 
for sustainable livelihoods. And not only for sustainable livelihoods in, um, in supporting our local communities, but also how that um, filters through into our employees whilst we leverage the benefit of technology and, and digitization. All of these, though it's framed as challenges, I think brings with it significant opportunity. We've seen that opportunity in how we operate. And Mark has touched on methods on how we can measure some of this performance. And we certainly um, have are rolling out um, IRMA, um, that is an independent resource um, um, evaluations um, program. And our UNKI mine in Zimbabwe has recently received the first um, accreditation through this Institute for Responsible Mining Assurance and received a 75% certification, being an indication that in some of our most difficult countries we're operating, we do have an opportunity to make a real difference in society. The decarbonisation in our country is heavily dependent on coal-powered fire stations, as I've mentioned e um, earlier, but I think in there, there's a significant opportunity for us in the greener energy sector to build a hydrogen economy that can not only um, address our own carbon neutrality, but is a significant um, resource for economic development um, in our country, not only for the country's decarbonisation effort, but also for a further economic um, development. So as a commodity producer, we know um, we were subject to changes in supply and demand of our minerals, and we see even more of that coming through um, in, in COVID and the COVID impact on supply chains into our business, but also us as a business into, into wider society. And we cannot step away but from, from recognizing the challenges that we have in market uncertainty and how we set up our businesses to, um, to run stably and sustainably through, through this um, uncertain markets that we've seen right through, through the COVID challenges but also then the uncertainty that we see in the energy transition. But we have a positive outlook and um, we've got a strong faith in the markets in which we deliver our product on. We know that PGMs um, is very well aligned with our purpose of reimagining mining to improve people's lives. We play a critical role in the decarbonization and making the future um, much greener and healthier. Um, and I think key to that as a last point then would be our partnerships. I think partnerships are key to addressing many of these challenges. It's key to addressing social, political and economic challenges of the worlds we operate in. And it's key to, for us to unlock some of our other challenges like water and, and energy security. And I think it is a prerequisite for us to ensure that we deliver full potential from the um, operations that we have the benefit of operating. Thank you, Roger. So, Natasha, thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, I think it uh, creates a perfect segue uh, into the next um, uh, contributor on the panel. That's Martin uh, Horgan. Uh, Martin, just before you come in, I think Natasha really uh, also nicely built on uh, Mark's point around partnerships for development. Uh, the fact that we have these huge interdependencies within the countries that we operate in, and there's been a huge focus on how we improve our community engagement, um, et cetera, and how we also in, are enabled to go through this just energy transition and then linking to the hydrogen economy. So uh, just from your side, uh, some of the specific challenges that you've been facing. Um, sure, over thank you. You. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Roger, uh, and thank you to Mark and Natasha for their uh, for their comments there. Uh, and a, a number of themes that we obviously recognise uh, from our aspects and across the sector as well touched on. Um, I think you, you know Natasha talked about local communities, and, and if we start off with COVID, uh, I think that has been a, a, obviously a, a, a challenge over the last twelve months, uh, and one that we've strove to strive to uh, to respond to. And I think our view was uh, recognising our responsibility to our own workforce, but importantly to those local communities outside the mine gates as well. 
And, and I think we've recognized that, you know, sort of looking after ourselves uh, it wasn't sort of for the broader benefit of our, our host jurisdictions and our responsibilities as a, a responsible miner in these host jurisdictions was to, uh, to actually support the government and those broader stakeholders as well. So I think that has been one of the sort of the key learnings for us in this stage about how we make sure that we are able to, to use our relative position of, of financial robustness and strength to benefit broader society. Uh, whether that's through the provision of testing and support to local medical services, through to education as well. Uh, and I think sort of, you know, hes uh, vaccine hesitancy uh, is something that we're all challenged with uh, across any jurisdiction we work in uh, and using education uh, for those workforces to promote that uh, uh, and sort of support the, uh, uh, the rollout of vaccination programmes uh, is a key aspect of our strategy here at Centre and in, in all the jurisdictions we work in as well. So I think working where we can to, to, to support local health services, working around those education uh, and where, uh, where uh, appropriate and possible supporting financially in terms of vaccination uh, acquisition and rollout to the broad society. Uh, that's something that we see as a, as a company, as a mining company, that we can certainly participate and support uh, the fight against COVID as we roll forward. Um, the other issue that obviously I think was quite interesting was around ESG. Uh, clearly, whether it's regulatory uh, requirements around reporting, as Mark's touched on, uh, or, or, or in terms of the actual sort of uh, implementation of technologies and Natasha touched on as well. I think ESG clearly is a, uh, is a key issue for the, the industry as we face it rolling forward the next 5, 10, 15 years and beyond. Uh, and we've all seen uh, responsible gold mining principles, as Mark alluded to, uh, and a number of investor initiatives, Black Rocks, uh, net, net uh, Zero Carbon and so on. Uh, Vanex supporting the principle, uh, uh, gold mining, responsible principle of mining, gold mining. Uh, and we see that both investor and societal pressure is really going to focus a, a spotlight on these issues for the industry. Uh, and I think the thing that we've been very pleased about as we sort of roll uh, of the last 12 months at Sensamin was how we sort of see historically that potentially ESG was seen as a cost to the business and something that had to be done to maintain a social license to operate. Uh, uh, within sort of uh, host jurisdictions or more broadly with the investor base. But actually what we started to recognize and realize is that good ESG practice is also good business practice. Uh, and if I look at particularly a number of the initiatives we're, we're rolling out, um, we've just committed to a solar project. We're very lucky in Egypt. Uh, I think it's one of the highest levels of solar radiance in the world uh, and a perfect place for a solar project. So we've committed to a, a new 36 megawatt plant, which will be commissioned next year. And when we look at that, it's a $35 million odd uh, investment uh, to deliver that. And that'll save us at current oil prices around $10, $11 million a year of operating cost. So from a business perspective, it makes absolute perfect sense. Uh, it reduces uh, reliance on sort of transportation, fuel and so on, uh, fuel shocks in terms of prices and so on. But when we then pivot across to ESG, clearly a fantastic opportunity to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as well. Uh, and really sort of bring it into that. We have a number of other initiatives that we're looking at. Uh, for example, uh, high capacity truck trays that allow our uh, lightweight compared to uh, current truck trays have higher capacity. Again, that reduces the amount of fuel burn uh, within an operation uh, when we move our mobile fleet around as well. So I think one of the things that we're identifying now is a number of our ESG sort of opportunities also are good business opportunities. We don't see them as a cost to the business. They're actually sort of beneficial to the business as well. And I think there's a, a lot of work we can go now to basically marry these two up uh, and respond to those societal uh, uh, expectations around uh, ESG issues as well. The other issue I, I think as well is, is it's a people's business. You know, mining always is uh, and always will be a people's business. The resource, uh, the geological resource is there, but it's actually people that make it work. Uh, and I think one of the other challenges that we face as a society, and Mark very correctly pointed at this, is that the perception of, uh, of mining as this industry, as this, I think Mark used the term around sort of uh, irresponsibly sort of, you know, environmental stewards uh, uh, across that, how we seen as a bit of a dirty industry. I think that's a, a significant challenge that we've got to address. And I think Mark's exactly right about how we must sort of take the initiative and take the narrative and push that forward. But to my mind, I, I think one of the other issues around that is the attraction uh, and retention of talent into our sector. Uh, when we look at sort of uh, younger people coming through graduate schemes, uh, apprenticeships on the workforce and so on, is that how do we as a sector attract and then retain the best talent out there? Because it's the lifeblood of what we need to do. Uh, and I think uh, a younger generation we're uh, more aware of, uh, of issues facing globally and sort of, you know, I can imagine an 18, 19 year old say that they want to get into mining. Uh, and a number of their peers would probably raise an eyebrow uh, and look quite interested at that sort of aspiration. But the reality is, is that mining drives our economy, you know, and we want a low carbon future. Mining is the, the, the industry that will deliver that low carbon future by delivering the raw materials that we need. 
and therefore our ability to attract that young talent into the sector to keep us moving forward is something that we have to address. And I think within that young talent as well, it will hopefully then start to address one of the other issues I think we have as a sector is around diversification in management, whether that be gender, racial uh, and so on. I think that is also another challenge for the sector that we have to broaden our appeal uh, as we go forward as well. But I think we can do that. As I say, I, I genuinely believe in, in mining's uh, ability to drive the future economy, uh, to be an essential part of that low carbon future. Uh, and with the right talent in our sector, uh, we'll be able to deliver that on behalf of society globally as we roll forward at these challenges. So maybe, uh, uh, Roger, from my side, I think there are some of the key issues to, to talk on. I was COVID response uh, uh, across our host jurisdictions, supporting local health authorities, supporting both inside and outside the mine fence, I think looking at ESG at the core of our business now, it's not on the periphery and I don't see ESG as a, as a cost, I see ESG as an opportunity. And I think as we look further into the sector, how do we as a sector respond to our, you know, ill-formed reputation, but also sort of improve that as Mark's alluded to and actually start to really bring in that young talent that's going to help drive the future of this industry. So Martin, thanks for that. Uh, uh, perfect input. I just want to add to your comment by saying that I think uh, what COVID has demonstrated is the Mining, mining sector's ability to really work with country governments and communities and organized labor uh, to really fight COVID in a way which what we call saving lives and saving livelihoods. It's just the way the industry has responded through the proper risk-based approach with preventative and mitigating measures, uh, working with government around getting vaccines out, working with government, making sure that we manage the situation. And I think the sector can be really proud. And I'm not talking about uh, a sector in one country. I'm talking about uh, the companies that are on this line of the work that's been done you know to really drive that agenda but i also think that your comment around the esg um uh requirements creating an incredible opportunity is absolutely spot on um, and perhaps one of the things that we failed to do in the past was occupy the public square on the role that mining actually does play a lot of people actually just really don't know what the industry does because we haven't been getting our message out there and i think the focus on esg is actually raising the bar and it's enabling us also to get out there and actually demonstrate what we're doing and when people see what we're doing in the various reports through uh, responsible mining principles responsible gold etc uh, it really demonstrates that this sector is very key um, and keen to make sure that we deliver a real sustainable development force so thanks for that let me then go across to uh, paul fisher you know paul you i know get to tackle this pretty much from a more global level given your role as, as the board chairman of the LBMA. So we're looking forward to your comments and then we'll get into the Q&A. And, and ladies and gentlemen on the line, we'd obviously appreciate all of you. If you have some uh, questions, just make them as difficult as you can, no stress. Uh, we've got an expert panel here, looking forward to seeing those in your Q&A on your screens, if you wouldn't mind passing those through, but let me hand over to Paul. Paul, thank you. Well, Roger, thank you very much. It's been a very fascinating discussion uh, so far. And one thing things I should note is that in addition to my role as LBMA chair, I actually do quite a lot of work on sustainable finance and I teach it and I've sat on various policy committees. And what I've been interested to hear is that the you know, three, three people speaking so far, all of whom have focused largely on ESG issues as the main challenge for the industry and focusing within that on the social aspects. Um, and I find that fascinating. Uh, I've done most of my work on climate change issues, and that's been rising up the agenda very quickly over the last five years. We've now got COP26, where we have great expectations of further movement forward. But what people may not realise is the way that social issues have been following on in the wake of that. And the context for that is that back in 2015, the United Nations announced 17 sustainable development goals with implementation due for 2030. And what we're finding is that policies and market developments which have been aimed at climate change, um, carbon exposures, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, are slowly being uh, taken on board for these other sustainable development principles. Uh, and I'll give you two. One is um, we've got um, disclosure rules coming. They're, they're voluntary at the moment. They're going to be made mandatory in Europe uh, around carbon exposures and carbon emissions and people are looking at what other disclosure policies could be put in place to support other so, uh, sustainable objectives. And in the marketplace, we've had a growing market in green bonds, um, and we're now seeing uh, a rapid rise in things called social bonds uh, as well. So we can expect to see the social side 
of ESG picking up pace um, going forward. In terms of the mining industry specifically, the responsible um, mining principles are a great step forward. Uh, and I think what's going to be necessary to follow that up is it's one thing to say you're res uh, mining responsibly, it's another to actually do it. But of course, it's a third thing to actually demonstrate to everybody that you're doing it. And the challenge will be to increase the amount of transparency, the accountability, uh, the independent assessment of that um, so that you can actually prove it to your investors and your customers um, as well. And, that, and that's going to be a challenge. Going back slightly to the climate agenda, I think the, um, uh, the missing piece for the industry there is we don't yet have any plans or commitments about how this industry as a whole is going to reduce its carbon emissions in line with government targets. We're starting to see various governments around the world, EU and UK, have already committed to net zero by 2050, and we don't yet know how the industry will fit within that. And we had better come up with our plans collectively, because if not, somebody will tell us we have to or give them to us, uh, and that won't be quite so good for the industry. But I wanted just to finish off with a slightly different topic, um, which is it's slightly aligned. Uh, a, a big challenge for our industry is that we know that tens of millions of people around the world are engaged in artisanal mining, but none of the output from that artisanal mining, and we're talking about up to 10% uh, of world supply, is going through what I would call the legitimate industry. It's not going into uh, responsible sourcing um, uh, through uh, LBMA accredited my, uh, refineries. So the conclusion must be that it's going into the illegitimate sector. And this is not good. Um, it's not good for us as an industry to have this small but significant component of uh, illegitimate mining going on. And it's, um, it presents some risks, basically, that there will be increasing numbers of scandals, environmental and others, and the industry as a whole will have its reputation damaged by these um, activities going on outside the sector. But I say that, that we know that tens of millions of uh, people around the world are supported by this activity. And the answer is not to try and shut it completely down. That, that won't happen, even however hard we try. But somehow we need to try and get it within the net. We can't keep saying, oh, this is also outside the fence. What we do inside the fence is fine. Uh, and I think we need to be quite imaginative and collaborative about how we try to get artisanal mining um, approved and within our legitimate space. Um, and I think the, the, the large miners can play a significant role in that. I know some of them have, have tried at various times. Uh, and I think this is an issue we need to, to focus on. I don't think our industry will be sustainable if we continue to have um, a small but significant sector operating outside um, our responsible mining controls. Um, so of the course there's a whole range of other issues affecting the industry. And I think the key thing to remember is that fossil fuel production, mining for fossil fuels is going to be seen as the problem. Uh, the supply of precious metals and other metals is actually going to be part of the solution because we need them to feed into the technologies for things like carbon reduction. But we need to distance ourselves from the other side. Uh, and we need to make the positive case for the industry. Um, and we need to be open and transparent in order to do that. Okay, Paul, thanks very much for that. And I think, uh, um... Just a couple of comments, and then I'm going to go into the uh, a couple of questions to uh, the distinguished members of our panel. Um, first one is, I think uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, companies are, um, and the industry is getting a lot better um, at understanding what it needs to report on from a sustainability perspective around the ESG standards. Um, so it's what the standards look like, then obviously making sure that they can collect the information over time and make sure that those standards are all relevant uh, and linked to each other. So there's a degree of recognition between the different standards that may apply for platinum to those that apply for gold as, as just as an example. But then also how to display it over time, developing that track record. And in fact, there are certain systems that are already in place around the world. Uh, there's the Canadian Towards Sustainable Mining um, system, which ha enables the companies to demonstrate a track record over time. And there's no doubt that the ICMM 
mining with principles um, and the responsible gold standards are going to do exactly the same in terms of the way that companies report on each of these areas. And Natasha did mention um, Irma and a few others um, where the companies have become a lot more transparent in their in their views. But one of the questions that uh, you asked and was kind of like posing to a certain extent was, well, what are, you know, what are the plans? I mean, there are individual companies that have got their own individual targets um, to um, have a, a zero net carbon by 2050, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There are uh, some of the companies that have come out individually, but uh, perhaps we can pose to the panel uh, some thoughts on the plans of companies um, and how we sort of take this particular process forward. And I was going to find out if Mark wanted to take that first. I mean, um, individual companies are looking at what they can do. Um, but your thoughts there, Mark, uh, Mark, if that's okay. Yeah, thanks, Roger. I think it's such an important aspect of the point of planning and plans. And the, the big gap that we face uh, as a globe, as mankind, is the lack of plans. We're, full, we're very long on regulations and very short on plans. And, and you know, one of the things I often challenge regulators, uh, of which there are many, how many of those regulators have actually been to emerging countries? Countries there, the majority of the population subsist. You know, more than half of mankind doesn't have access to what we take for granted. Uh, for those people, setting up the regulations that take for granted and we've got a big challenge and we've got a and that's where mining plays a bigger role than any other industry is that we do reach out into these frontiers of the world economy and uh, and the more we can share the pie that i referred to the better uh, mankind will be going forward so you know i think uh, paul touched on a very uh, uh, important point, and that is, you know, I I bet you that there will be no time spent in COP26 about plans for those part people from society that are going to be left behind by the regulators. Mark, thanks for that. So, uh, Martin, on your side, uh, any thoughts um, uh, on, on that target. And then I'm going to go to Natasha and ask her in particular around, you know, as we go forward around the hydrogen economy and how the companies can play such a leadership role in this space. So I think, uh, Roger, that, that, you know, for us, as we start to think about how we deliver 2030 targets and 2050 targets, I think it's the recognition that there's no silver bullet. Uh, and I think it's going to be a coordinated framework of, of different strategies leading to a carbon reduction. Uh, I think the sort of the general sort of, uh, uh, sort of consideration is replace. Uh, reduce uh, uh, and uh, displace and then offset. So, you know, can we find alternatives to fossil fuels for, for power? Uh, you know, solar being the obvious example I mentioned before. Can we reduce? Could we pivot to the use of gas in Egypt versus uh, using diesel for power generation? Still a carbon emitter, but significantly less. Uh, can we reduce our energy use? You know, lightweight truck trays I mentioned before, better productivity gains. Uh, can we sort of improve our processing plant sort of optimization? Can we reduce that? Uh, and obviously the final point, which I'm personally skeptical about, is around offsetting this idea that one can sort of, you know, have this environment impact, but offset that by planting some trees somewhere. I personally, you know, have a, an issue with that. But I, I think it's going to be a multi-pronged uh, strategy that when you look at that, how do we as a sector uh, respond to it? And of course, technological advancement, as we look at the likes of the battery technologies that improves, uh, the likes of hydrogen coming through as potential fuel source as well, where the hydrogen is generally or possibly generated through the use of solar, for example. So, so I think as a, a, you know, it's a recognition from my perspective that there's no single silver bullet to this, and it's going to have to be a coordinated framework that we either as individual companies, or to Mark's point, more broadly as a sector, uh, bring to it, uh, and then sort of hand in glove, quite frankly, with some technological advances that will allow us to take that forward from there as well. So I think that's the challenge. But as I said before, I think it's also the opportunity. And, and Natasha, I mean, if you if you if you think about uh, this sector, invariably plays a significant leadership role in driving particular uh, ideas forward. Uh, so hydrogen economy. I mean, you've got a project underway, 260 ton articulated dump truck, powered by a platinum fuel cell. I shouldn't be giving stealing your thunder on this particular equation, but again, this could change the world. Uh, mobility powered by hydrogen uh, is something which could the mining sector could play a significant leadership role in with the OEMs. Over to you. 
Thank you, Roger. And I'm assuming it's because you feel so excited about the um, project as well. So no worries that you, um, you've you done half my presentation. That's all good. But I think it is probably in that technology and collaboration space that we have a significant role to play and, and, and value to add. So the project Roger is referring to is we are in, um, in the process of developing a um, a drive train and it is a 300 ton um, truck that we will um, put this drive train in towards the end of the year. It is the biggest drive train of its nature fueled by a hydrogen fuel cell. Now the exciting thing about that is that it doesn't only um, make up an important part of our own decarbonisation strategy. I think it plays a role as um, as a mining industry in technology development. As we've done so over so many years as a mining industry, we have been leading um, in terms of technology development. And this drivetrain has got the um, application not only in, um, in the mining industry that is easy to, to scale, but certainly in many other applications. I think the other thing that's interesting about this is that we will um, fuel it with green hydrogen, not on day one, but certainly on day two. So in addition to that, we are building a 100 megawatt PV plant that will um, de deliver green hydrogen for the, um, for the use in, this, in these trucks. And the, the interesting thing about that, I see one of the questions on the, um, on the chat is about the cost of green, um, green energy. And it comes at us as about 40% cheaper, um, all costs considered. Um, than, than the fossil fuel alternative and obviously a very different level of reliability. And not only that, but certainly starting to think about community participation and really driving for long-term community participation. We've spoken quite a bit about inside the gate and outside the gate and more and more, I believe, we need to consider how we drive opportunities for sustainable livelihoods outside the mine gate to allow communities to become self-sustainable and not reliant on mining. And so in addition to all of that benefits, we are um, working in further partnerships with our local communities to give them that sustainable livelihoods. Okay, Natasha, thanks for that. And I think that's uh, that could be a complete game changer uh, for all of us. And I think uh, the mine minerals that we're talking about, and I think all of the speakers have uh, very clearly uh, articulated um, are very much the minerals that are going to help change the energy future of South Africa, you know, over the course of the next 20, 30 years. One of the questions that's coming through is if the, the investment. So the first one is to Jonathan from Jonathan Butler. Um, that was just about uh, uh, decarbonization impacts on CAPEX. I think, Natasha, you, you almost answered that question. Just uh, is it offsetting CAPEX you would have spent somewhere else or is it just becoming such a necessi necessary business case and maybe uh, we could get Mark and Natasha to give an input there. I think Martin's already kind of like alluded to that. And then the second question to uh, all of you on the panel is just to say, how do we deal with the artisanal mining related side? I mean, I think uh, Paul asked a really good question. How do we, for want of a better way, say legalize or uh, bring the artisanal small scale illegal mining sector more into the formal economy in, in some way or another uh, and any solutions that you may have there? Natasha, Mark, and then and, and then Martin, and then we'll go back to Paul just for some closing comments. We've got uh, exactly um, eleven minutes left, so time is rushing by. Natasha, um, you want to go I first then, and then Mark. Yes, from a capital from a capital point of view, it obviously needs to compete against um, other capital in in what I think a mining is, the industry is getting far more um, disciplined in terms of capital expenditure. Um, but if you look at the overall cost, it's certainly cheaper than what we, including capital, in, um, cheaper than what we are paying at the moment. Okay, thanks, Natasha. Mark, your comments? Uh, Roger, two things. Uh, you know, technology is important, and you know we've seen the the mining industry start to wake up uh, to technology, and uh, you know it's it's important if we want to be acceptable to future generations, we're going to have to invest a lot more in technology, not only just to be compliant, uh, but, you know, there's a whole lot that we can do. I think, you know, Natasha has really touched on it. We've got so far to go to actually deliver on the 2030 objectives and, and we're going to have to, you know, invest in technology. So it's not, uh, you know, if it is how that we've got to, you know, really invest in. On the illegal mining thing, it, I think it gets back to my point about 
you know, the world leadership needs to reach out. We saw that in the 80s uh, with the, the, the developed countries reaching out to Africa to forgive debt. Um, we've seen a, a, a vast neglect of a, the emerging world from the developed world as the world moved towards populism uh, and individual sort of inward focused policies rather than uh, looking back over the whole uh, challenge across the globe. And, and again, you know, illegal mining is one of that. You know, poverty is, I believe, poverty is even more dangerous than climate change. Um, because if we don't bring the rest of the world with us and give them an opportunity, we will continue to see more and more radicalism in the, in the world. So, you know, it's a big responsibility. We have to look at, uh, at, um, at a, a global solution. And, and this, the sad thing is if we look how the world's managed COVID, it's been a disaster. Uh, it's definitely not an example of how we should have behaved as a global community. So, uh, I, and I, just to finish off, the mining industry has been a standout force in managing COVID, but uh, you know, the rest of the world has done a pretty bad job of, over it. Yeah, exactly, Mark, 100%, I fully agree. And uh, so just shifting to Martin, Martin, your take, I mean, you indicated that, uh, you know, investment in these sort of technologies and uh, a number of the ESG requirements is not a cost, it's an investment. It's uh, kind of like makes business sense and you kind of like, uh, see that progressing. Any further thoughts? Um, it doesn't displace existing CAPEX. It basically replaces um, basically some of the operating costs that you would have had incurred uh, through other sources. And then just your take on uh, uh, the ASM Tisnal small scale mining issue and how that should be more formalized. Sure, sure. Uh, look, on the, 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 the uh, CAPEX, OPEX implications for that, I, I would just turn that around and, and just put a, another spin on it just from the other side of the table is that when one is comparing uh, an investment in a technology that that has uh, you know ESG benefits, you know, uh, uh, you know Natasha mentioned about obviously the, the hydrogen, I think that's great, obviously. Um, but I think the important thing we need to do is that we need to fully recognise the cost of the alternative fossil fuel generated opportunity and things like carbon pricing. So if you're looking at sort of you know it's a chance to put a, an X million dollar capex program in on this basis, what's the NPV IRR of that? But also when trading off against the, uh, uh, say, for example, a diesel or an HFO power generation uh, alternative is that, you know, not just what's the input price of the of the fuel source is that, you know, we've got to add in that, that additional carbon pricing as well. What cost per ton are we looking at as well? So when we're having a true uh, sort of trade off on this is we're not just looking at sort of, you know, the two input costs. What is the cost of that carbon uh, to the alternative as well? So I would say, look, just fully echo what Mark and Natasha have said there before. And my own spin is just make sure that we properly costing the alternative and sticking with a fossil fuel when we're making those decisions from a broad perspective. In terms of the ASM issue, um, look, you know, uh, I've been around Africa for the last 20 odd years um, and sort of my views on, on ASM, it's an essential part of the economy in, in a number of places. Uh, to Mark's point, you know, it is the, the primary source in a number of areas where subsistence farming sort of fills people's tummies and then there's a, a short season whereby people do a little sort of cottage industry type uh, 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 sort of mining that puts a few pence in the coffers and, and from there as well. And I think sort of that level of sort of uh, uh, ASM, um, you know, how does one sort of stop a family or a small couple of families in a small hamlet sort of from doing that when they sort of have this balance between them? And I think, you know, looking to eradicate that or try and regulate that is a difficult thing for host jurisdictions and industry. I think where I personally have issues is where one sees these large scale, semi-mechanized, organized artisanal sites. Uh, and one starts to see the use of blasting coming in, uh, the use of cyanide in sort of small CIL tanks dug into the ground with plastic sheeting. Uh, and I think that is the big thing to challenge. And, and, you know, who funds and drives these things, quite frankly, you often see machinery there. These things are, are far from sort of the small family type stuff as well. So I think my own view would be if we're going to try and tackle ASM, it would be tackle those sort of semi-industrialized, semi-mechanized type organized uh, large scale camps, you know, tens of thousands of people in some cases or, tens, or thousands of people, maybe not tens of thousands. And some of these camps and all the social issues, the health issues that come with that, uh, the security issues, funding the likes of sort of, you know, terrorism that we see across the Sahara as well. So I think from my perspective, I kind of have a differentiation of the, the mum and dad type sector of it. And, and that, you know, has a vital part to play in a, a rural economy. And I think it's that sort of organized type artisanal working that has big environmental and social impacts. I think that's where we need to focus our industry and regulatory response less at the mums and dads at the sort of that level there. 
Okay, great. We've got exactly uh, uh, five minutes, four minutes left. So it gives all, each of you one minute each uh, to maybe give a last couple of comments um, before we do a quick poll at the end of the session. What I'd like to do is go straight across to Paul and maybe if in, in, in your last comments, any thoughts on resource nationalism as a threat that's coming back to the issues around uh, fairly sharing the growing pie, I think, uh, as, as Mark was trying to talk about it. But uh, quick, any last comments, Paul? Just a minute each, Paul, and then I'm going to take uh, uh, Natasha, Mark, and, and Martin, and then we're going to hand across to Taylor for the poll. I, I think it's going to be a big issue work for things like rare earth uh, minerals, which um, are in short supply and located in particular countries, and it's going to happen. Uh, the world is still very nationalistic, and people are going to look after their own local economies first, and who knows what sort of problems that's going to raise. Shouldn't be a problem for gold. Uh, biggest demand um, for gold in the world is from China. It doesn't produce half of what it uses, so there's still going to be massive um, exports to China. But that's been the case for thousands of years, as I understand the history. Um, I'd like to echo two points that Mark said very quickly. First of all, when talking about ESG, there's far too much um, stuff around how much is it going to cost us. Th this is an agenda where firms are going to have the opportunity to make a lot of money if they get it right. To, and to reduce costs and they also risk losing a lot of money if they get it wrong or they ignore it so from the point of view of the individual firm i think it's important to get on the front foot and try and use this agenda to one's advantage and we've heard some examples today of how that can happen and the other one on the social issues um absolutely if we get climate change and the world continues to warm we know who's going to suffer most it's going to be the poorest uh, countries the poorest in society within those countries that always happens um uh, but if we don't bring those countries with us, it's going to make it much harder to prevent climate change. So, for example, if we want India to stop using coal-fired power plants, we are going to need to help them. Uh, and that's going to be the rich countries are going to have to step in um, to do that. I hope that's the sort of thing we might see coming out of COP26, but I'm not holding my breath. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Natasha? Last comment? Last comments? I think um, probably not much that I can add. I think um, national nationalisation remains a risk in my in my mind. I think um, what's in our hands are certainly the advocacy that we should be doing for the good work that we are doing and the impact that we are making as a as a mining industry. Um, I think ESG is a prerequisite to that, and really, I think that just transition for me goes wider than just um, coal fired pipe or um, coal-fired power station or hydrocarbon energy sources. It is around that entire energy transition and how we take poorer countries with us. And I think if we don't do that, we run the risk of further supporting the nationalization drive or the fact that our communities will not allow us to operate and develop our assets to its full potential. Natasha, thanks for that. Mark, across to you. Last thoughts? Oh, whoops, Mark, you still unmute there? Oops. Subject, uh, you know, of a resource nationalization really sits with, again, the regulators and the investors, the fund managers, because they're driving us back to those safe countries, inverted commas. And, uh, and the mining industry has a great opp opportunity and, and is capable of really embracing the world and giving everyone a chance to participate in a new, more modern uh, um, economy. And so, for us, we should, you know, I would suggest that we sh we should all be looking on how we can invest in emerging markets and through that example, uplift both the politic and the social uh, situation in those countries. And so that's my my point. And I think we can do a great, we do already do a, a, a make a big difference as the miners, but we can do more. Be the real catalyst for change. Great. Martin, last comments on your side? Oh, look, I think Natasha and Mark have, uh, have touched on the resource nationalist side with, with Paul there. Um, uh, maybe just from to tie back to one of my comments earlier, uh, and I think this ties into some earlier comments as well, is that I really think we do a lot of good in the sector. Uh, and I don't think we're very good at telling the broader society what we do. Uh, and I think we've got a bit of a PR issue. Uh, and I think we can do a lot more to basically to, to, to combat the comments that, you know, the, the, the views that Mark had highlighted before. And I think as a sector, we can get on the front foot, be proud of what we do, how we help society, how we can sort of deliver that low carbon future. And I think if we can do that, it'll help us a lot in the medium term as well. Great, fantastic, Martin. Well, thanks very much to a fantastic panel. We could have spent two, three hours uh, going through the topics, but I'm gonna hand straight across to Taylor uh, to do the 
uh, poll right at the end. Taylor, through to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for that session. Um, I'm going to launch a poll now. Um, so which is your favorite speaker? You, you will hear some clock bells in the background of um, of where I am right now. Um, the, the options are Roger Baxter, um, our lovely moderator, Mark Bristow, our keynote speaker, Paul Fisher, Martin Horgan, and Natasha Vildren. I don't know if I've butchered the pronunciation of that completely. No, <laughs> Villian, okay, there we go. <laughs> um, and um, our, our three lovely uh, speakers on the panel. Um, so please get your answers in. Um, and I'll give you a few more moments for that. Um, excellent. I feel like I'm on Strictly Come Dancing here. <laughs> well, you know, you very well may be. That could be the prize. <laughs> That's to be voted off this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and eagerly anticipating the results. Um, excellent. Um, so I'm going to end the poll very shortly um, I, and launch the new poll, Key Challenges Facing the Global Mining Industry. So... Uh, please rate the session. Uh, please rate it well. I, I think I speak on behalf of all the delegates. I hope that it was an excellent session. Um, uh, but yes, excellent. So uh, with that, uh, Roger, I'll leave you to uh, wrap up and uh, farewell our attendees. So thanks very much to our incredible panelists, Mark Brister, Natasha Fulhuen, Martin Horgan, and Paul Fisher. Uh, it's been a really interesting session. Could have done a lot more from a timing point of view, but I think uh, some real uh, takeaways uh, from this particular session. Excellent bits uh, on how this in industry is leading the charge on meeting the challenges around ESG, uh, around skills retention, around better occupying the public square on the role that we do play in society and continuing to make a real difference in as a foundation for economic uh, and as a catalyst for economic development around the world. So just want to thank my panelists. They've done a fantastic job. And for all of you um, for dialing into the particular session. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, at, at next year's uh, LBMA conference uh, on this particular topic. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Colleagues, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Well, that is it for the recording. If you did have any questions throughout, please email us at ask.lbma.org.uk and we'll make sure to get back to you. Uh, moving on from this webinar though, and onto other webinars and events. Uh, in two weeks from today, we have a webinar on inflation, tapering, and the global macroeconomic outlook. Uh, joining us to discuss those things will be uh, Jim Steele, from HSBC, we'll have Rona O'Connell uh, from Stonex, and finally we'll have Suki Cooper uh, from Standard Chartered. So this will be the first in a series we have dispersed throughout the year, um, where we'll have the trio join us um, and discuss how these things unfold throughout 2022. So do join us if you can. Uh, we can email you the registration link or you can find it on our website. In February, we have two training dates. So we have uh, Introduction to Local London and How to Use Local London on the 22nd and 23rd of February, respectively. Uh, so the first course, Introduction to Local London, is exactly that. You'll learn about the local London market, you'll learn about goods delivery lists, you'll learn about LBMA, you'll learn about a full range of things. If you have any questions about exactly what that entails, just send us an email and we'll let you know. Um, the How to Use Local London course is a, is a deeper dive into what is taught on the previous course. Um, so if you feel like you do have a good understanding of the basics and you want to have, if you want to garner a bit more of an understanding, this is the course for you. Again, if you do have any questions, please send us an email um, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, finally, in March, uh, we have our Responsible Sourcing and Sustainability Summit. Uh, so that will run from the 28th to the 30th. More details will follow, but do save the dates. Uh, so with that, I conclude this webinar. I'm looking forward to another year uh, full of many more. Um, uh, as always, if you have any suggestions for speakers, for topics, um, or if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, do send an email through to ask at lbmate.org.uk. We welcome your thoughts, we welcome your opinions, um, so we can make up more and more of these lovely webinars. Uh, so with that, thank you and have a lovely, lovely afternoon.